Hey, it's Norm from Tesla.com, and I'm so excited to be here at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. I'm here actually at Mission Control Center, one of the mission control rooms here with Bill Foster. You're a ground controller That's for right. NASA. And what does that mean? What, what is your responsibility? You're ground control. I am. I'm looking for Major Tom. Yeah. <laughs> and, and every now and then we still get a blip, you know, but, but it, it don't have them located yet. Uh, ground control is responsible for the building. We report directly to the flight director, and our job is to make sure that everything in the building is working right, that our network is connecting us to the space station correctly. The flight director, he's the most important person in the room? Well, no, the ground controller. Oh, yeah, but, yeah. So. But other than that, yeah, the flight director is the boss. The uh, flight director has come up through the ranks through various positions, and they have the responsibility, he or she, for crew safety for spacecraft safety, and then for mission success and that order of priorities. Now this is an international operation, so we have a flight director here, we have a flight director in Moscow, we have one in, at the European Space Agency in Germany, we have one at the Japanese Aeronautics mm -hmm. Agency in Scuba Canada, get one? Japan. Uh, I've never talked to a Canada flight director. They, they probably have yeah. one. Now their, their control center isn't always online uh, when the robot arm is going on. Yeah, but, but the Canada arm. The Canada arm, yep. But this flight's the lead flight. Mm. He has overall responsibility for the controls, for, for the International Space Station. Uh, the other ones, the, the European Space Agency, they are responsible for the Columbus Lab module. So if it deals with the Columbus Lab, then they have the overriding control over that. But for the health and safety of the entire assembly, our flight will talk to the flight director in Moscow, and between the two of them, they will decide what needs to be done. Mission control is so cool. It's how the public sees the experience through how we interact with astronauts and in space. Right. We see it through the eyes of mission control. And there are so many different roles and responsibilities. And there's ground control you mentioned, there's the flight director, yes. and what are the other roles that, that support the astronauts? We've got several different types of flight controllers. We have the operations type. They're the ones like the ops planner is our lead ops position that's planning the schedule for the crew. So they work with the, the flight team, both on console and offline, to make sure that for tomorrow's plan, for next week's plan, and for next month's plan, that we know roughly what the crew's gonna be doing, what the various partners throughout the, uh, the network that we use to control the space station in Japan and Germany and Canada and at the Marshall Space Flight Center. Everyone's in sync and knowing what we're doing as a plan. So that, that's our ops positions. You also have our systems positions and these are the people that look at what's happening on board space station. Uh, people like our Spartan or Thor, uh, thermal people, power people, attitude determination and control officer, that's the bus driver. Huh. You know, for the space shuttle and previous spaceships, the crew on board did all the local commands. They had the steering wheel, right. basically, and they controlled what happened on the spacecraft. But the space station is so large, and the crew's focus has to be on what they're doing on board on the science and maintenance, that there's no one on board really driving it or steering it. And so that happens right there. Right with ADCO. So if we want to change how the space station is oriented in space, uh -huh. ADCO sends a command that changes how the the gyros on board, the huge momentum wheels are, are turning, and that'll actually cause it to shift around. If we're planning on raising the orbit of the space station, which you have to do every now and then because it, it drags in the upper atmosphere just a little bit, but enough to bring it lower. The ADCO works with our TOPO officer, our, our trajectory operations officer, and plans a burn that's used primarily with a a visiting spacecraft like like the uh, HTV or, mm -hmm. or ATV or, or sometimes with the Progress or Soyuz or sometimes even with the last Russian module right. on board. And, and we'll do a minor maneuver that raises the, the altitude of the space station. And as the support team for the space station, this is an operation that runs 24-7. Yes. Right? There are people here nonstop. It's been running since uh, 2000, 24-7. Wow. So uh, a few months before we put the first crew, Expedition 1, on board, uh, we have been monitoring. In fact, we actually started monitoring the space station in 1998 with the first launch. The first uh, module. The first modules that went up, the Russian module in November of 98 and the uh, first U.S. module in uh, December, about two weeks later of 98. So we've had a small team monitoring that, making sure all the systems were working. But as we got ready to put the first crew on board, then the team expanded, moved into the, the formal control room for it. And whether it's down the hall where the first one was or in this room where we've been since October of 2006, 
it's this facility is up, like you say, 24 seven. So if you go to the different rooms throughout the building, you'll see different sets of plaques in them. So in this room, and you can't see it from the camera, but over on that side are missions that were supported back in the early days. Apollo 7 was supported out of this room. A lot of the uh, shuttle missions uh, over on the other wall, you're seeing a lot of the more recent missions that were supported mm. uh, with the space station. And over in the, in the corner of the room, a little bit lower, is our memorial flights. We've got the Columbia mission, the Challenger mission, and Apollo 1 that are represented there, plus a what we call the space flight memorial emblem above it. And that's what reminds us of what can happen if we're not doing our job correctly, and also honors the crews that we've lost in human space flight. And the rooms you said have evolved over time and they're continuing to evolve. So, you know, this room has LCDs and, and big screens, but the mission control five years from now is gonna look different. Right, we, we have a major project going on that we call MCC 21, you know, 21st Century Control Center. And we're, we're pulling the blue consoles out. Of course, the blue consoles replaced our old green consoles that were tied to mainframes. And when we moved to these consoles, we moved off the mainframes to distributed networks using Unix-based platforms that gave us a lot of capability and flexibility. But we still kept Windows-based PCs that we did a lot of administrative tasks on. And, See, and Windows we, XP right there. There you go. <laughs> uh, we've got a lot of different servers that we use and control for different functions. And you know, it, it's light years ahead of where we were. But it, now it's getting a little obsolete. In our new MCC 21, we're gonna have one platform. It'll be a Windows-based platform that will let us do our workstation work, monitoring the ISS systems or sending commands to them, but also let us do all of our administrative tasks. In fact, when we go to there, we're gonna be able to work from the office if we need to, work from home. We're gonna have- VPN in and- VPN, we're gonna have firewalls set up to where we have an internal, very secure network that you can only access from within the mm -hmm. walls. But we'll also have that connected to a, a less secure network that lets us firewall in. And if there's a security breach, we very quickly shut the gate yeah. and anyone on the outside is cut out. And we're still operating and doing all the vital things we need to do to control the space. When are you guys gonna get touch screens? Um, not with the next one. <laughs> it's all keyboards and It's all keyboards, keyboards still. still. Yes. That's a good point. I need to bring that to you. <laughs> yeah, you want to zoom in on, on all the data. So it looks like in the big screens right now, you're monitoring the ISS. That's right. And on the center screen, you have you know, the, the flight path. It does orbit the Earth four times four times a day? No, at about uh, 15 to 16 times F a day. 16 times a day. Right. And then it looks like you have a live feed to the, to the International Space Station right now. Yeah, so we've done a recent upgrade to our, our bandwidth up and down to the space station. It, it, before this, we could bring down four separate video feeds. Now we have six video feeds. We only have three screens in the room we can display them on. But if you look around the room, you'll see some TVs that are like at the flight directors, all six feeds right. are, are available there. And so, so when the astronauts can actually interact with the, the flight controllers and directors, you know, talk to a microphone or something and, and have a conversation? Yes. Yeah, and, and in fact, we, we can do that when we do special events with them. These are all standard definition feeds coming down. But we also can bring down a high definition feed. And when that happens, we usually put that on the center screen, replace the world map, and we'll have a, a very nice HD <laughs> event go on where right. they're talking to us or to a uh, NASA public affairs or to whatever they're doing on that. But it, it's a lot of capability. We actually can bring down 300 megabits of data on our K-band. Wow and we can send up 25 megabits. So we have a... a it's better than what I have at home. Yes. Yeah. We, we have a what we call the joint station land, the JSL, an onboard version and a ground version. And when we have K-band connection, we can actually connect those two networks so that the crew has a live connection to the internet. And that's being relayed through a system of satellites. That's correct. Our, our satellites go through, are controlled out of White Sands, New Mexico. There's a constellation of five satellites that we use, all in geosynchronous orbit, scattered around the Earth. Uh, most of them are positioned so they can see the ground station at White Sands. So that leaves an area over the Indian Ocean that's, that you can't really use for either of those satellites. Mm -hmm. So we have another one over there that talks to a ground station at Guam and then remotely sends that data back to White Sands before coming to us. That one has a little less bandwidth, so right. we, for, for station, we don't get video down when we're using that particular ground station. So they wouldn't have their connection to the land, but we can still talk to the crew. And that's at the worst case, you just wouldn't have a video feed. That's and right. That, and that's an anticipated planned loss of signal. Yes, we use that one no more than we have to. 
but it does fill in gaps when we're having critical activities and we need to be able to talk to the crew. How, how closely does ground control and mission control monitor the crew and interact with the crew? And do you get a chance to leave them alone or do they have their private time? <laughs> uh, they do have a lot of private time. You know, the funny thing is in the earlier days of the program, we did our Skylab missions and you know, it's expensive sending people into space. So when you put them up there, you want to get your most for your bucks. You, you schedule their time very tightly yep. and, and, and work them very hard. And it's not a vacation. It is not. And for Gemini, Mercury, Gemini, mm -hmm. Apollo, that all worked well. Skylab, the first one went about 20-something days. That worked well. The next one, about 40-something days. Pretty much worked well. The last one was 84 days, about Testing 40 the days into yeah. it. The crew just revolted. Yeah. They quit talking to the ground. <laughs> they quit doing what they were supposed to. And you know, we learned a big lesson from that. So on station, we, we have a shorter work day than we did for shuttle. You know, shuttle was only a two week mission at mm -hmm. most. So we worked those crews. Even then we gave them a day off on the long right. missions. But for station, weekends off, holidays, it oh, gets, okay. it's a six month period that the crew's up there. But they actually get full weekends off. Right, we have strict limits on how much, how many hours we work them during a regular day and how much time they need off. So they get, they can't come home after work, you know, so that's a real drag. But well, they can Skype home. They can Skype, they can uh, read a book, they bring instruments up. Right, I take know photos, Chris Hadfield has a guitar up with them. Yeah. And, uh, and, and something that was interesting I didn't know is that over there you, you have an indicator that says crew sleep. Yes. And there's a countdown timer when the crew is anticipated to sleep. They get eight and a half hours of sleep, but they all sleep at the same time. Yes, they do. We're watching the station for them. So there's not a concern that there's not anybody awake up there. We have several people in the room at all times. And if there's anything going on, we can wake them up. You know, we can send an alarm up to them if they haven't already been woken up because right. the, the station's a smart system. Mm -hmm. It's got onboard alarms. If it sees something that's out of parameters, it will sound, it'll wake the crew up. If we see it, we'll call them and wake them up if they need to take action. If, if something happens that they don't need to take action, we're not going to bother them. We'll send ground commands and we'll tell them about it later. And, and so right now, um, this facility is monitoring the current operation, which is ISS, the current mission. Yes. And in the coming years, what will mission control be running? Well, we're, you know, hopefully this is going to continue for several more years here. But we're also making, making plans to support the Orion flights mm -hmm. that are coming up. Uh, that's NASA's next uh, manned space capsule. Our first test flight, which won't have people on board, is in uh, September of 2014, so about a year and a half from now. And we'll support that out of another room down the hall that's been completely re-engineered to the MCC-21 side. Uh, we also have uh, Boeing has a, their CST-100 capsule that they're working on that'll take people up to the space station as well as other commercial ventures they're working with. And we'll have room in this building for them to, to do operations out of. Orbital Cygnus, uh, is doing a, a spacecraft. They just had their first test launch um, late last week that was successful. And uh, just a few weeks from now, they'll do their first cargo flight, the demonstration flight to the space station. So th there's a lot of ventures, both commercial and NASA, that are coming up that we're working with to provide support out of this building. Keeping you busy. Uh, it is. It's a good thing. All right. Well, thank you, Bill, so much. And may you have more successful missions and plaques under your belt. And right, we're doing our next plaque hanging this afternoon oh, for Expedition 34. Awesome. So Great. Norm, it was great talking to you. Great talking to you, Bill. And we'll have more from the Johnson Space Center and from NASA on TESA.com. Stay tuned. See you guys next time.